Thank you, everyone. So I've been asked to talk about MLPerf. Uh, so there are two things I want to talk about. I took some liberty to add some of the other technical content which I wanted to talk about. So there's two things. There's machine learning, and then there is deep learning. So we will start with deep learning, and I want to talk about deep learning benchmarking at a single node level as well as at scale. And then I want to go also into the machine learning, and I want to introduce similar concepts in the machine learning world as well. So let's get started. Okay, so what is MLPerf? So MLPerf is not an NVIDIA thing. It's, uh, it's an industry-wide benchmark suit on which all the vendors across the AI industry have agreed upon, along with the academia, that what should go into the initial versions of the MLPerf. This was decided last summer, and the first iteration of the benchmark submission was done around, I think, November or December. So what is included in MLPerf is seven different uh, deep learning models. The first one is the image classification, which people know as ResNet 50. In simple terms, this is classifying cats and dogs and, and oranges and apples. The second one is uh, there are two object detection algorithms, heavyweight and lightweight. One of them is uh, oriented around uh, triangulating the objects within a context of other objects, and the second one is more like a generating a mask for all different objects. So basically, the lightweight is a bit lighter in terms of computation. The other one is a bit heavier. There are two translational models for uh, translating between languages, and uh, one of them is a recurrent one and a non-recurrent one. I will not go into the deep details of these models because each of them is an hour-long presentation. Uh, then there is a recommendation model, which is basically depending on, the, on your previous likes about movies or videos, it recommends you new videos or movies uh, depending on your likes and uh, uh, correlating you with other users. And then you have reinforcement learning, which is similar to AlphaGo, which, and mo most of you here know about the AlphaGo and how it managed to, to do the Go competition. Okay, so this one doesn't work. I'm going to use here. Okay, so uh, last, uh, this December, we submitted along with other vendors like uh, Google and Intel, the MLPer first iteration of the benchmarks. I have to say this one currently only includes training benchmarks. There are no inference benchmarks yet decided by MLPerf committee. So NVIDIA managed to set six records in AI performance, and those records are from single node level to scaling across many nodes. And uh, we submitted, out of the seven categories you saw before, we managed to submit into the six categories for single node and five categories for multi-node. So again, MLPerf is an open source uh, benchmark. You can go to the website, download it, and run uh, and submit your own results if you, if, you, if you are interested in this. And MLPerf also includes two categories. Number one is also single node and multi-node, but along with, on each of them, they have two categories. One is a closed category and the open category. The closed category basically has a fixed set of parameters or the hyperparameters. Most of you know that when you have a neural network and a training, when you increase the batch size or reduce the batch size, the performance varies a lot. So the closed category doesn't allow you to change the hyper-training parameters. While the open category allows you to change all the parameters, tweak them so that the vendors have the opportunity to get the best model that suits their architecture. So we managed to submit in six different uh, single node categories from uh, except the last AlphaGo, because it was more CPU-oriented benchmark rather than any GPU activity there. And at scale, we managed to run on uh, multi-node configurations for five different benchmarks, because the recommendation engine was too small to run at scale. And all these benchmarks are run on different configuration of uh, the DGX systems. Okay, so what, what happened in the last four or five years? It seemed that, it seems like the ResNet 50 model, which took so many days in the beginning from Pascal, from the Kepler architecture using just CUDA with new architecture innovations along with the software stack, 
you manage to get more and more performance and reduce the time to train to a point where a single machine now takes a 70 minutes to at scale takes around 6.3 6 minutes to train it. And how do we manage to get this performance? Is it the hardware, is it the software, or is it some, some training tricks? The answer is simple, it's, it's integration and it's, uh, it's basically tuning knob across all the stacks. This is a very easy concept and it's been around for a very long time. But doing that in practical life basically means you have to tune each and everything and you have to communicate dependencies along the whole stack. So the basic pillar of GPU compute is the CUDA architecture, followed by the innovation in CUDA architecture, which was made in the Volta architecture by introduction of tensor cores. Uh, the NV link or the NV switch, which was introduced into the DGX2 systems, which allows you to connect GPUs together within the same node. And the integrated software stack, which is basically all the NVIDIA libraries along with the driver, along with the CUDA, and all everything packed into a single optimized framework. So let me, I'm not going to go on the CUDA side, but let me break down the tensor core. So what's a tensor core? It's just a matrix matrix multiplier, very easy to do. If you want to do it on your ASIC, it's super easy uh, to implement a matrix multiply, but the difficult part is to do it at scale and to, to bring the data to the tensor core. So how do you actually uh, access tensor core? So currently you can access the core through uh, NVIDIA libraries like CUDNN or Kubeless or TensorRT. And then at the, at the CUDA level, you can access through C++, uh, C++ functions. And at, you have, we also have something known as CU Tensor, which is a BLAST4 library I will talk about in the next slide, which can also work with CUDA with, with Tensor Core. So what is CU Tensor? CU Tensor is a brand new library, which is again open source. And it basically allows you to merge different tensor operations and optimize them by defining them as, 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 a, as a graph, sort of. And it allows you to do things like tensor contractions, permutations, addition, element-wise operations on tensors. So going from BLAST3 to BLAST4. It also supports mixed precision. precision. Basically, you can, you can have multi-precision tensors working together and contracted together as well. So how mixed precision has been an idea into many fields, and a lot of people have been talking about mixed precision. But doing things in mixed precision is also not easy because you also have the challenge when you have a, sing a single precision or double precision, you, you know how it works and you expect a certain level of accuracy. But when you constantly switch between half or float, you need to make sure that the errors that have prop been propagated because of the half precision are taken care of. And all those things are done behind the hood into libraries like MXNet or TensorFlow. All the user needs to do is basically enable a flag and they can start training their models in, in mixed precision. And here are some of the performance gains for different models like ResNet 50, the NCF, the recommendation engine, the BERT model, the GNMT model, and if, if you want details of these models, we can take these questions offline. But then the question arises that how do you, what about the accuracy? What about the learning rate of the models? So uh, depending on the model, there are techniques that when you train in mixed precision, you can actually take care of the errors at the different, different convolution layers or different ne neural network layers. And we've been, we have, without compromising, we have introduced those sort of layers in, in different networks, like AlexNet or the Inception Net or the ResNet 50. So you can take uh, direct advantage of mixed precision training. And tensor cores are not just used in AI because there's a lot of HPC community here and I myself, I'm an HPC guy. So tensor cores are also used in some of the HPC uh, applications and a lot of research has been done around tensor cores in HPC using low precision arithmetic for HPC. So some of the examples I can give you is plasma, fus plasma fusion applications which uses a lot of uh, uh, solvers like magma. Magma provides you a solver which can do mixed precision uh, linear system solving. You can solve your linear system to a certain degree in half precision and then 
When you are at a particular convergence rate, you immediately switch to float, and this allows acceleration of the linear solvers. There was also some AI-powered weather prediction done at, uh, recently. At, I think this was a part of the Supercomputing 18, one of the applications. Uh, and this was more on the AI side. Some of the earthquake simulations that were done, I think, on the to from the Tokyo Institute. Uh, so this is something I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but people who don't know, just to give an idea what a DGX2 system looks like, you have eight GPUs on the top, eight on the bottom, with other accessories, some Mellanox cards, and, and an, an NV switch at the back so that you can connect things together. So we talked about the tensor core, the CUDA was, people are already aware of, the tensor core, which is a key component on the ML perf, and the second key component is NV switch. So what is NV switch? NV switch is not a switch exactly, uh, it's an onboard connecting fabric layer, so it's not going outside the single node. What it allows, it has 18 NV link ports with 50 gigabytes bidirectional bandwidth, so you have an aggregate bandwidth of 900 gigabytes, and because of high bandwidth and 18 ports on it, you can actually connect each and every GPU on the DGX2 on the top, top board with each and every single GPU on DGX2 on the bottom board. And that allows you, that gives you a full interconnected crossbar network. So you can ping from one GPU to the other GPU at a very high bandwidth and a low latency. So how do you program this complicated, highly fabric layer sort of uh, machine? Because it provides the all-to-all -all bandwidth, high, 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 high bandwidth all-to-all -all between GPUs, you can actually use something known as CUDA unified memory. You can allocate your memory across all the GPUs, and then you can basically access memory of remote GPUs just like you are accessing your own memory, uh, GPU memory. And because of the driver, it automatically takes care of swapping the pages between multiple GPUs and also takes care that if there's no enough space on the single GPU, you actually migrate the page automatically. You can also do atomic operation across all the GPUs, so you can actually do atomic reduce to a GPU memory which is not your own. And you can also do something like CUDA cooperative kernel launches. So when you launch a GPU kernel, you can launch a GPU kernel which is cooperative across all your GPUs and it's using memory across all the GPUs. So basically with all these concepts in place, you can program the whole system as if it was a single GPU by using single allocators to, alloc uh, to manage your memories and launching single GPU kernels across all GPUs. So that's the the NV switch part. I wanted to talk about nickel, but I think Gil did a pretty good job, and he covered extremely well more topics than I wanted to cover, so I'm not going to spend time here. So yeah, we managed to scale it to many GPUs on the, on the Summit system, but again, I'm not going to spend much time here. So how, how can you get all this? Well, most of the ML Perf is open source. Our libraries like nickel is open source. CUDA platform is open source. All of them are freely available to download and use. But still the problem remains that how do you aggregate the stack? So what we do is we actually provide bundles of all these libraries and we create a container, put it into the NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is basically a registry which can have all your, which, which basically has all the types of containers, including basic containers like CUDA or HPC containers like Gromax, to, to workflows for medical imaging, like Clara, which, allows, which is basically a medical imaging workflow, and it allows, you, allows various medical applications like image detection within the radiology images and everything. You also have pre-trained pre models. That means all the models are trained for you. All you need to do is take the container and start uh, running inference on them. And again, NGC also, it's freely available. You can register online and download, download any container. And also, all the MLPerf containers that were submitted for the MLPerf benchmark are also available on the NGC. So you can download the MLPerf containers and you can also replicate the benchmark results that were submitted, provided you, had the, you have the, the system on which they were running. So what are the key points to take away? So NVIDIA models are available for use across 
all different benchmark types from not only just image classification or segmentation, but also for recommendation engines and all of those benchmarks. NGC is our container registry and you can download a container today and run it on your desktop or HPC clusters like CSES or workstation servers or your cloud service providers like uh, AWS or Microsoft. So we were managed to run six out of uh, seven workflows on the for the ML perf, which which is something uh, it's good, which shows that the versatility of the of the of the GPU architecture. It's been argued for a long time that GPUs are not versatile or they can do only this thing or CPUs are versatile. But slowly and steadily, you can see there are a lot of more things that the GPU can do with programming efforts. The Tensor Core GPU are the fastest. It's a little bit specialized architecture for AI, but at the same time, it's a general architecture that is a basic operation. It's a matrix multiplication, so it's a good combination between generalization of an architecture as well as a specialization. And the platform is available from your desktop GPU to your sometimes even the laptop GPUs. If you have a laptop GPU, you can also run your models and infer on the laptop GPU. So this, this is what the, uh, the more or less the ecosystem looks like when you have the use cases here from the, from the application side, from the medical side, from, from HPC, like the weather forecast, molecular dynamics, and creative like graphics side. And then on the, middleware, on the middle layer, you have the frameworks where you have TensorFlow, Rapids, which is something I'll talk later, uh, PyTorch, and here you have HPC applications like Amber, NAMD, Gromax, and here you have some of the graphics related applications. And on the bottom you have all the CUDA X or the NVIDIA libraries for machine learning, deep learning, HBC, uh, the G virtual GPU virtualization and other uh, graphics applications. And then on the bottom you have the whole CUDA ecosystem with CUDA primitives, CUDA libraries, math libraries and uh, the driver layer. So. So I talked about uh, deep learning at scale. It was probably too much overview, and I wanted to go more deep, but given the time, it's not enough. So the next thing I want to talk about is Rapids. It's our machine learning at scale, and I'm very excited for this in particular because if you, if you get rid of the jargons from machine learning and what's been going in the community, you realize that it's very much related to the HPC and the traditional HPC applications. So what is Rapids? So what do machine learning guys do? They take some data, they prepare the data, they import the CSV files or whatever data format they have from Spark or Hadoop, and then they take the data, they augment the data, they do a training, and this is not, the model is not typically like a deep learning model. You, the, basically the user has a control over the training model, they train random forest, or an XGBoost, or a simple k-means, or a k-nearest neighbor clustering algorithm, that's their model. And then after the model is done, they analyze the model, they see the output of the model, the different learning rates, and accuracy. So what is Rapids? Rapids is basically three different things. It's a CUDF, so CUDA data frame, which is basically a way to handle data within CUDA. You have CUML, which is CUDA machine learning, so this is a set of all the machine learning algorithms, like k-means, random forest, etc. Then you have CU graph, which is basically a graph algorithm, so you can do graph analytics through this. And this is all based on the top of CUDA and the Apache Arrow, which is the data format used in the machine learning. So these are all the jargons which basically scare HPC folk away, saying that, oh, what is all those new things? But if you break down all of these things, then you realize those are basic computational algorithms paired with communication. So, but the new part which is exciting here and something that even HPC can use is the Python layer which is provided on the top of the machine learning algorithms. So a user can have access from the Python level as a standalone Python code or as a Python notebook and you can import your data in a single GPU or multi-GPU with something known as task, and you can run your CUML algorithms from the Python layer. But you can also do that from the CUDA or C++ side, where you have all the ML algorithms here, then you have the ML primitives, which I will cover this two segments later, and then this is built on the top of multi-node or multi-GPU communications library. So 
At the bottom, you have single node uh, algorithms with uh, all the communication layer, and then you have the multi-node algorithms. So what is, so at the heart of Rapids is again CUML, which is your basic mathematical library that allows you all the different algorithms. What, what does it provide? It provides a Python layer, so people who want to stick to the Python and you, they want to use their, their, they want to analyze the data from Python, they can use directly from Python. You also have the algorithms which are directly accessed by CUDA, C++, and the primitives. The so primitives are low-level, basic, linear algebra operations. And there are a lot of primitives. So in primitives, we have linear algebra things like element-wise operation, AX plus BY, a simple matrix, mat matrix uh, sorry, vector-level operation, or a simple matrix multiply, or norm, somebody wants to find the norm of a vector. Eigenvalue decomposition, or a single, singular value decomposition, transposing a matrix, or doing a QR decomposition. Those are something, those are the ML primitives which are currently available. And this is a very much project in flux. So, and it's an open source project, so people are constantly developing these projects. You also have more, more ML primitives, uh, like CU RAND, so you can random number generator at a distributed level. Distance, so find the distance between two vectors or the two solution vectors to find basically the accuracy of your of your outputs, and other functions coming as ML primitives. On the top of ML primitives, you build algorithms. And what are these algorithms? So number one, you have classification or regression, where you want to classify your data into, into different categories. So you want to classify if, if, if a person likes this, or a person doesn't like this, or a person likes X, Y, or Z, which one of the following, depending on on your data set. And for classification, you use something like a decision tree, a random forest. And decision tree and random forest is basically, an, it's just a machine learning name of a tree structure that basically, if you go from the top to bottom, will tell you where's the output, what does the person like. Depending on your input, it gives you a particular classification or particular class value. You also have regression, which is, for example, if you want to see if a flight takes off from London to Zurich, and what would be the delay if this is the weather, this is the thing. It gives you a regression value that depending on the parameter, it looks like the delay could be 10 minutes, something like that. Then you have inference, like the Bayesian inference model. Uh, clustering, so classical clustering, I think most of you might know what clustering is here. K-mean, so DB scan. So these are really fundamental things used in machine learning or data science. Then you have decomposition and dimensionality reduction. For example, if your data set is in, has 24 dimensions, it's very hard to look, look at such, such data sets. It's hard to imagine a data set being plotted in 24 dimension, and you want to reduce it to three dimension. You can do something like a PCA, or a single value, singular value decomposition. Then you have time series forecasting. You want to predict how many bananas does a, does a store need to keep so that the customers are also satisfied, but the bananas also don't go to waste. So things like this you can do with time series forecasting. All those algorithms are a part of the CUML library, and they could be accessed from a Python level or a C++ level. And then on the top of this, you have something known as Dask CUML. So this is the layer that allows you to have your data set, if, you large in, if it's large enough, you can have it across multiple GPUs. Because in most cases, big, big, if you have a lot of data, it might not fit on the single GPU, and you really want to scale it across multi-node and multi-GPU. And for that, you have DAS UML. But even though you use a single GPU or multi-GPU, all that changes is just at the object handler. Instead of using CUML directly, you use Dask CUML. And that's it. And you tell, tell Dask about the amount of resources or the amount of GPUs you have, and it will, un underneath it, it will take care of the communication and uh, scaling the algorithms across many nodes. So again, this is the technology stack. At the, at the, at the bottom, it's always CUDA and all the CUDA libraries. And on, on the top of CUDA libraries, like like CU Solver, NV Graph, Cutlass, or Kubeless, and along with some CUML primitives which are implemented using CUDA, you build a CUML algorithms. 
This algorithms are then interfaced with something known as Cython, and then they provide an API in Python. So the user can enter at the Python level or the CUML level directly and can start playing with this. Again, all of these is an open source project. If, if anybody here has specific requirements, they're free to add their content or also try to start a PR on the new content. And people are developing not only NVIDIA, but across industry on this uh, machine learning framework. I'll take two questions, a few questions, I guess. All right, thank you.